Okay, hello everyone to this week's uh, Applying Ethology webinar. Um, I'm happy to see that we have a lot of new names in the attendance list today. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the webinar. And before we start, I will have some very brief announcements uh, and uh, notes on, on the webinar itself. Uh, as you might have already seen, uh, you can check the program uh, in the webinar channel with the uh, uh, pinned messages. You can also sign up through the calendar so you get regular reminders on the talks. Uh, and you can also find a speaker forum where you can um, propose to present a talk or a presentation yourself on a topic of your choice. Um, for, the webinar, for the webinar right now, um, I just want to say that you please take care that your camera and microphone is switched off. And if you have a question on the slides, um, you can put this question or these questions uh, in the chat function uh, here on the Zoom uh, conference window. And we will ask these questions if they're urgent uh, right immediately or at the end of the talk from Christina. So yeah, feel free to drop everything that you have in mind regarding her talk in the chat function and we will deal with this uh, at some point during the talk. This being said, uh, I'm happy to announce today that we will have uh, Christina, Dr. Christina Rufner uh, presenting uh, her work here at the webinar. Christina was uh, doing uh, and completing her PhD in, at the Wet, Wet Swiss in Bern, um, working on keel bone fractures in hands. Um, and she's continuing to do so now as a postdoctoral fellow at UC Davis. Um, keel bone fractures were her, her main focus during the PhD, but she was also working on identifying individual mobility patterns or behavioral patterns uh, of hands in a haste or, or in, uh, in bigger groups. And this is what she's going to um, present today in her webinar talk. And this being said, uh, the online stage is yours, Christina, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for the introduction. Um, as Christian already mentioned, I'm currently at UC Davis, but what I'm going to present today is um, stemming from my PhD work in Bern. Um, and I'm very happy that so many people made it here today and let me talk about two of my main, or two, two out of my three favorite topics which are chicken specifically, but also um, the individual, individuality and individual behavior patterns in laying hands. Um, the reason why I really like this topic is because um, if you think about precision livestock um, management advances in recent days or years, more likely, um, there have been a lot of those um, in bigger species, but I feel like chickens are often a bit neglected when it comes to looking at individuality and how um, an individual performs in a large group of birds. So, um, now, here we go. Um, this is a picture from um, a neighboring housing system in Switzerland. This is a flock of laying hens. Um, and here you can already see one of the bigger problems we have here. So um, laying hens are often housed in really, really big groups. Back in Switzerland, the maximum group size was kept at 18,000 birds per flock. Here in the US, it's very different to the in barn where there are 300,000 laying hens in one flock. So it's definitely a an incredibly big number for birds in one group. Um, but it also somewhat implies or makes you feel like if you walk into this, into this group, you perceive these birds more as a flock or a group rather than individuals within the group. So that's definitely one of the main problems we're facing with looking at laying hens and also welfare specifically. Because welfare and also behavior is something that is, um, or mostly welfare is um, something that's, that is experienced by the individual. So it's extremely important to actually look at the individual, individuals for that group welfare. Um, looking at individuals in these groups is difficult due to multiple reasons. First of all, um, they just really look all the same. Um, and that's a, a fact that we know are um, bred to, um, they are hybrid breeds, so they are genetically really, really similar to one another, um, but also, there are small animals in large groups in complex housing systems. So if you just walk in there and want to observe one individual bird, 
in one individual bird, that's rather harsh because you can't really distinguish them from one another, but also they are really likely to disappear somewhere in this housing system. That's the third problem we have if you want to look at individual birds in large groups, um, especially if we want to use technology, because apparently we cannot just walk in there and do observations by ourselves, but we need something like some kind of automatic um, tracking device that works in these systems. But there the problem is that we are working in an environment that is mostly consistent, consisting of metal. Um, so especially in these Avery systems, we have different tiers and providing different resources. And just because it's more biosecure and it's easier to clean, this is um, out of metal, which in turn disturbs lots of signals. So for instance, RFID signals are disturbed by metal. So it's really, really hard to use these kind of technologies. Um, in addition, we're working in a closed environment, so also GPS tracking doesn't work. Um, so with that, we also come to our last problem, which is that we're interested in not only two dimensions, but in three dimensions. So compared to other housing systems or say broiler chickens, which are just moving on the floor and therefore just in two dimensions, we are really interested in how the birds use the different resources that are provided on these three different or multiple different tiers. Um, so we are really interested in the third dimension as well. So um, overall, lots of problems when it comes to tracking individual chickens. Um, but today I would like to present you some results that we found using a custom-made tracking system. Um, this was developed um, if specifically for, a specific, for our barn that we used. Um, but we had no idea whether it's actually going to work. So we had four main objectives. First of all, we just needed to validate it. So we wanted to know whether what we observe um, with the system is actually what the hens are doing. So whether our direct observations actually match um, the recordings from the system. Um, as I already mentioned, we had no idea what we were going to find. So to the going to find. So we just assumed that there might be some kind of movement patterns in these birds. And if they were some movement patterns, um, we wanted to see whether individual birds are having some kind of consistency in their patterns, whereas different birds might show some variability in their movement patterns. So pretty simple, but as I already mentioned, com combined with lots of problems. Um, to, look, to work on our objectives, we tracked 13 hens um, using an infrared tracking system. Um, so these 13 hens were housed in a commercial aviary system in a group or in a pen um, with 225 hens. So this is far away from a commercial group, but nevertheless, it's bigger than like small groups of say 10 hens where you could do that by marking individual birds, um, say using some kind of tags or backpacks or similar. Um, these birds were towards the end of the laying play period, so they were 61 weeks of age, so they have settled really well in their given environment. Um, and for each bird, we observed them as up to 10 days continuously using our tracking system. From these 10 days, we had 16 hours of direct observation for our validation purpose. The tracking system we use consisted of two different um, units. On one hand, we had infrared emitters. So you can see them, if you can see my um, cursor in the left image in these um, uh, circles, these little boxes are our infrared emitters and they sent out a specific infrared signal um, depending on they, where they were installed. So we had divided our aviary systems in five different zones and I will come back to these zones in a minute. The other unit we used were the infrared receivers. So you can see them in mounted here on the bird's leg, on these leg bands and these co containers. Um, these receivers basically received the infrared signal sent out by the emitters with a frequency of one hertz. Um, and I will come back to that later. But basically the receiver woke up once every second, recorded the, um, the infrared uh, signal that was sent out by the emitter and therefore we could track the location of the birds. Now coming back to the different zones of the Avery. This is the system we used. Um, it's a commercial system that you can buy if you want to have a chicken barn <laughs> that is used across the world. So both here in the US and in Europe it's a really common system. Um, the first zone we looked at is the litter area down here. In this zone, the birds have litter available so they can explore, they can stress, scratch, and they can dust bait and so on and so forth. In the lower tier down here, um, the birds have feed and water as well as perches. These perches are mostly used to move up to the, towards the upper tiers. 
um, but can also be used for roosting, of course. Up here, we have the nest boxes, um, and again, um, a perch that mostly serves to um, move up and down, but also because it's high and birds pre prefer height to roost, um, they definitely use these perches a lot during the nighttime. And then the very top tier, again, here we have feed and water, as well as lots of perches for nighttime roosting. In addition, we had an outdoor area, which we call the winter garden. It's basically covered, so the birds um, are protected from outside influences, but it's fresh air, sunlight, um, usually water, litter, as well as perches um, for them available. Um, now these small little boxes in the image here um, indicate the location of our emitters, as well as the specific signal they sent out. Um, so if you look at this bird here in zone number three, sitting on the perch, you can see that she's wearing this small little tag on her leg. Um, as long as she stays on this perch, her receiver is going to pick up the signal from um, emitter number three. So she's in the zone three, um, as long as she's moving around there. Um, once she jumps, say, um, to the nest boxes on this small, like this grid, this balcony, her receiver then picks up the new signal and writes down a data point. So as soon as the signal changes, um, the system records a data point with the exact um, time as well as the new um, entry zone, basically. Um, importantly, I have to mention here that as long as the bird is moving within, within one zone, we have absolutely no information about what she's doing. So she could either be standing um, on the same sec exact location for an hour, or she could be running back and forth without, as, so as long as she doesn't change the zone, we don't have any information about activity or um, behavior in there. So our um, tracking system just looked at vertical transitions um, and how, um, Yes, exclusively. So that's basically the only thing we could track there. Um, first, I would just give you some numbers just to show you that our tracking system was indeed accurate, which was surprising because we had lots of problems with um, chicken poop causing short circuits or mites crawling into these different um, units and basically destroying them. But we made it run in the end and we found that 94 um, percent of the direct observations we did were also picked up by the system. We had an, an accuracy of eight seconds. Um, this delay could be caused by, for instance, if a bird is sitting in front of um, one of these emitter and the bird is entering the zone and then the signal doesn't go through because of this one bird sitting in front of it and um, things like that. Um, if we then look at the number of movements per day, we had on average 80 movements or transitions per day. Um, but if we look at the range, we can see already that there is a huge range there. So it's between 27 and 130 um, movements per day. So quite a big variation there. If we then look at the zone entries, um, we can see that most entries were into the lower tier and the, win uh, the litter area, followed by nest boxes, whereas the top tier and the winter garden were visited less often. This is just to give you an idea about accuracy and the validation of our data, as well as how the birds generally use their system. But obviously we want to look at specific patterns and not just these summary numbers, basically. And for this, we used time series. So we did a visual analysis um, where we basically graphed our time series and movement patterns, and we created one time series per day per hen. And this is what I'm going to call hen days. So please remember these hen days. In addition to the time series, we also use network graphs, but I'm going to talk about these um, later on. So just to get, orient your, um, your you on this time series graph, um, on the x-axis, you can see the time of day starting at 2 a.m. until 5 p.m. Um, this is basically when the light is on. From 10 until 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. approximately, this is when the winter garden was open. On the y-axis, on the other hand, you can see these five different zones, and you can imagine that it's basically a vertical cut through this aviary. So the top tier is on top, then the nest boxes, lower tier, and so on and so forth. Now, each of the dots in this graph indicates its own change. So all the um, dots down here are changes from or to the winter garden. The ones down here in the litter, then we have all the lower tier entries and exits, the nest boxes, and the top tier. Um, so we have the dots that indicate changes, but we also have the, the vertical line, and the length of this vertical line indicates the duration of stay. So if you look at 4 a.m. in the morning, 
you can see that this bird um, jumped from the lower tier into the litter, stayed there for a bit more than an hour, and then moved back to the lower tier. This is how you interpret this um, time series. Um, next, I'm, gonna to, I'm going to overwhelm you with some graphs, but I'm, don't worry, it's not that complicated. So here are lots of time series graphs. Um, now, importantly, on the left side, all the ones on the left side are hen, say, hen A, whereas we have all the hen B um, plots on the right side. So these graphs are just from two hens on the same consecutive 11 days. And without going into details, which dot is where and so on and so forth, there are two main things you can pick up here. On one hand, if you just look at all the left ones versus all the right ones, you can see that these patterns seem to be really, really consistent. So hen A basically does the same thing every day, whereas it's the same for the other hen. So if you look at the left graphs, this hen likes to spend a lot of time in the litter area. She moves pretty seldomly from time to time. She seems to stay in the lower tiers um, and seems to prefer these areas. Whereas if you have a look at the um, hen on the right, there you can see that this hen moves mostly from the lower tier, uh, sorry, from the litter to the top tier and doesn't really spend a lot of time on any of the other tiers. And she does these transitions quite often every day. So that's the one thing. You can really see it that the these birds are consistent within bird. But also you can see that they are very, very different from each other. So whereas you have this very active birds on the right side preferring either litter or the top tier, the left bird doesn't go to the top tier at all and moves really, really rarely. So these are just the main things you can pick up by just looking at them. Um, so overall, yes, there seem to be consistent patterns within and variation between hands. But there are also more things we can look at. So I talked about specific movement bad patterns. Um, I also talked about different resources being assigned to these different tiers. So if we now look at specific locations at specific times of day, this days, specific times of day, this might enable us to actually look at behavior as well. So um, I just brought one example, looking at nest box visiting patterns. So again, these are three different birds. You can see, and, and I just highlighted the time of day when they spent time in the nest box area. So again, we don't know whether they actually were in the nest box or not, but they were just in this, um, in this zone. There's not a lot of other resources there, so we just assume that they are potentially laying an egg. So this bird here on the very left, you can see that she goes into the egg, um, nest box every 25 and a half, and a half day hours. And then she takes one or two days of a break and then she starts all over again. So this is basically what you would expect from, the, from an egg laying hen. The reason for that is that the egg production takes longer than 24 hours and the hen has to lay her egg first before she can start initiate the next ovulation. So it takes her, say, 24 and a half, up to 25 hours to produce an egg. Um, she has the latest egg, then the next ovulation happens, and then the whole process starts again. So egg laying itself is delayed every day by a certain amount of time. In addition, so that's what you can see with this shift towards the end of the day. Um, in addition, what is also really um, logical is that at some point, She's, she takes a break and restarts her cycle again. This is because um, ovulation is highly time, time of day dependent. So at some point it's just too late in the day to actually initiate an ovulation. So she basically has to restart her cycle and start all over again in the morning. So this is what you would expect, uh, expect and what makes perfect sense biologically. On the other hand, we have this hen here in the middle. She visits the nest box approximately um, every 24 hours and she does that every day. And this is obviously what producers want, right? You want to have a hen that lays eggs consistently, that lays more eggs, and does so um, preferably before you go in and collect the eggs. So this bird here, I don't know whether you can claim that um, this is breeding success, potentially. We don't really know, but we had basically half and half birds laying eggs 24 hours, every 24 hours, or with the shifting pattern. And then we have these special cases here on the right with birds that never visited the nest box area for a certain duration. Um, there are two explanations there. I, either the, these birds don't lay any eggs or they lay their eggs in, on the floor or on the system. Both cases are obviously very um, unideal for productivity because um, 
no X are no X, and X core and system X are um, dirty and cannot be sold. So also really interesting these, to look at these patterns from both the producer's perspective, but also trying to link um, locations with potential behaviors. So now I talked about um, lots of, about the time series, but I also promised to talk about network graphs. And here they are. So these are just a different type of visualization. Here we have three hens, A, B, and C, on three consecutive days. Um, the dots here are, or the circles are the different areas. So blue is the winter garden, red is litter, and the lower tier nest box and top tier in green. Um, the arrows indicate the, uh, the direction of the transition, the transitions as well as the frequency. So the thicker the arrows, the more um, transitions have happened in this specific direction. Now, if we look at hen A, you can see multiple things here. First of all, obviously she moves mostly between the nest box, lower tier, and the litter, as indicated by the width of the arrows. Um, you can also see that she uses all the different tiers, um, but you can also see that she always goes step by step. So she always goes from five to four to three, and so on and so forth. We don't know, know whether she's doing that in order, and how often she's doing it, but we can, we can get this information about where is her focus basically of her transitions. Now, if you look at hand number B, there are again, multiple things you can see here. First of all, she never visits um, zone number five, the top here, which is interesting and also causes this very different shape of, um, of the network graphs. And also she moves a lot between the winter garden and the litter area. And mostly, again, then from the litter to the lower tier, but very, very little in the upper areas of, the, of her Avery system. And now looking at bird number C, which looks very, very different. Um, here, we, what we can see first is that she, again, moves really often between lower tier litter and winter garden, so more the lower areas. Um, and then there is this one specific movement, which is this arrow between four and two. So this arrow indicates that she jumps directly from the nest box, box into the litter area without going step by step, basically. Um, which is really, really interesting because she doesn't do that often, but she does it consistently every day. So these network graphs are just offering different opportunity to look at this that kind of data and to visualize it differently and also pull some other information here. Now, um, visual analysis is really nice, but us as researchers, we have the tendency that we will really want to have numbers here. So we also wanted to know whether statistics can do the trick. For this, we looked at three different um, statistical approaches. First of all, we used a linear discriminant analysis based on summary variables. So we basically pulled from our data the total number of transition for each bird and day, so for each hen day as well as the number of transitions into all of these five zones. So we had six variables total and wanted to see whether these variables can explain bird ID, whereas the hen days were basically replicates for, for each bird. We then um, used a hierarchical cluster, a clustering algorithm based on the same exact same summary variables. That was our second approach. And our third approach was dynamic time warping. Dynamic time warping is basically the only official time series analysis technique. And for this, we used a different unit. So instead of just looking at the changes in zones, we split up our time series into um, one data point per second. So if a hen stayed in one area for one hour, she would have 3,600 data points for the same area. And that resulted in each hen day um, consisting of 54,000 data points. So quite a bit of data set also needed a lot of, um, uh, that needed quite a bit of uh, calculating time. Um, we then put these, or basically um, um, inputted these, this data into a dissimilarity matrix and used again a hierarchical clustering algorithm um, to, to visualize the data. So overall, we used three different methods. Doesn't really matter what they are, um, but they were different. Um, and we wanted to see whether hen days are more similar within than between hens. Because if they are, that indicates that it's not just us looking at these graphs and saying, oh yeah, they are, they, they are consistent, but also um, the computer actually showing that numerically they are more consistent within than between hands as well. Um, now the time warping, time thing, I would like to spend um, a minute on that just to give you an idea how it works. So here I plotted two time series. The 
the one on top here is basically, you can imagine, that's just a random example, a bird moving from one, three, one, two, one, one, one. Um, this is the time series you can see in the matrix on the right on the x-axis, basically. Then the second time series um, is very similar, but just shifted a bit to the right. And this is what you can see on the y-axis, the time series two. Um, the matrix itself is uh, the sum of square matrix. So in classical um, time series analysis, you would basically just draw a line all the way through this matrix and compare each time point or each observation to the same observation the next day at the exact same time. So this is rather undynamic. What we are doing, and also causes a lot of dissimilarity, because also a really, really tiny shift in time already causes a lot of dissimilarity. Now with the dynamic time warping, warping, what we're doing is basically we connect each observation with the most similar connection uh, observation the next day, um, irrespective of time. So basically, if you look at the, at the matrix on the right, we're basically looking for the path through this matrix that is the, the shortest, but also causes the least dissimilarity. Um, based on this matrix, we then can then calculate a dissimilarity index, or also called height, and can plot that in a dendro dendrogram. So on the x-axis, sorry, y-axis, you can see this, this um, index, whereas on um, all these branches indicate hen days. So starting from the left, always the first number is always the hen ID, and the second number is the day. So it's basically starting from um, hen one, day one, and then the next one is hen one, day three, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at these different clusters, we can see that we do, we indeed, we get three um, distinct clusters, and all these clusters only con contain hen days from one specific hen. This is just an example with three hens. Now, looking at all of our hens, um, we get a different dendrogram. Um, now the different colors of the boxes indicate different animals and the arrows indicate the misclassified um, hen days. So the very first arrow on the left, you can see that there is a hen 17 on day five. This day was misclassified into hen number in the cluster of hen number 18. What you can also see is that hen number 17, her cluster is right next to hen number 18. So apparently these two days are extremely similar, but still most of the days were correctly classified for either hen 17 or hen number 18. So with the dynamic type more being out of our, all of our hen days, we had five misclassified days basically. And this misclassified days, this is also the metrics we use to see whether these techniques were suitable. So um, here, um, just to show you what I mean with this, um, we have all these different, our 13 hens and the three different methods we used. And there are some birds where all the different methods had a 100% success rate regarding the correct classification into one cluster. There are other birds that were um, classified rather poorly. Interestingly, it's not always the same method that um, misclassified them. So um, up here, for instance, the first red one, um, linear discriminant analysis was the worst, whereas the second one, it was dynamic type warping. So apparently there seem to be really, well, it makes sense that there are other differences that these um, time series analysis techniques cannot pick up just numerically. Nevertheless, at least 84% um, of, um, like comparing the different methods, um, Dynamic time or uh, linear discriminant analysis was basically our worst one with 84.6 correctly classified hen days, which is still quite a good rate. So now I'm done with the numbers. I would just like to summarize um, what I just told you about. So first of all, yes, our validation was successful. Um, and apparently the system works in these specific circumstances. We could also see movement patterns. So we talked about the nest box visits, but we can also look at roosting times and locations. So if you're interested in that, I have some slides, have some more slides for that. So looking at where do they sleep and do they do that consistently? Um, also, and here that's basically connected to my three, uh, third most favorite um, chicken topic, the keel bone fractures, as Christian mentioned before. And we can also look where the birds actually fall in their system because falls are associated or are assumed to be the main cause for um, keel bone fractures to occur. So this is definitely another nice movement pattern that we can identify from these visual um, time series graphs. 
When it comes to consistency, again, yes, we did find consistency. Um, there it's really, really interesting. I would be interesting to see whether how health and stress affect consistency. So for instance, with stress, you could say, okay, um, either they are less consistent because they're stressed or they are more consistent because stress has this effect of either moving less and therefore being more consistent. Um, so it would be really, really interesting to see these interactions there. Um, in addition, consistency is definitely related to management. So if a barn is managed the same day every day, I guess that also contributes to consistency. And it would be really, really interesting looking at personality and whether different personalities are more or less consistent in their behavior. Then looking at variability, um, that's one of the, for me, more interesting aspects. Um, I'm pretty sure that looking at resource access would be really, really interesting because as I mentioned, these resources in these systems are, um, are basically um, assigned to different um, areas. So I could imagine that a bird that is higher ranked has earlier access to feed for instance, or to the nest box and so on. So it would be really, really interesting to match these um, information, the, the mobility patterns with information on what, what resources do they actually use. Um, another aspect that I think is really, really interesting is what I call system overload. So um, all our space requirements in these systems are calculated based on the whole accessible space. For instance, with the perches, each bird, get, bird gets 14 centimeters of perch space. Um, now, we, you saw that there are perches all over the system, but most of the birds prefer to, to roost on the top tiers. So that basically reduces the, um, the perch area per bird um, tremendously if they all move up there. So it would be really, really nice to see, to actually overlap all these patterns and see are there spots or times of days where lots of birds are using the same resources and so same areas, which could cause problems related to high density, for instance. Again, um, personality, definitely a really interesting topic to see which birds are the more active ones, which birds are the less active ones and so on. And definitely, again, coming back to keelbone fractures, it could be that the more active hens are the healthier ones. Not necessarily, we don't know. So with that, oh, also most importantly, it's not only visually, but we could also see that numerical methods work as well to show that there is consistency and variability between hens. Yeah, with that, I would like to thank you and I'm really curious to hear your questions. Thank you, Christina, for this very clear and nicely illustrated talk. Um, as Christina already mentioned, we are happy to get questions in the chat function. Uh, I will ask them then directly to her. Um, I have a, a quick run. Uh, would it, do we have any uh, option to differentiate between a general increase in activity levels? versus a more goal-directed activity, like that a certain hen is moving to certain locations because it wants to acquire a certain resource there, or whether they are just in general more active and then randomly just accidentally happen to switch levels in the, in the, in the enclosure. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the thing is that in theory, in the barn, all resources should be present at all the time. So except for the winter garden, which opens and closes at certain time, but also feed, they're fed at limit at libitum. So in theory, they should always have access to feed. However, there is fresh feed. So just talking about feed, fresh feed delivered for every now and then. Um, so we actually looked at whether fresh feed de delivery, whether that somehow coincided with birds moving to the tiers where they have feed. Um, but we just we just, just didn't have the, the resolution to actually look at that. So just given that, or just assuming that all the resources are present at all the times, I would rather say, or I would just assume, and that's just speculation, that it's more social dynamics that affect how birds are moving. Um, just because we know that this group size of 225 birds is rather unideal. So birds can distinguish one another up to say 50 birds. And after that, we assume that they form some kind of subpopulation within the group. So I still have a data set somewhere where we have basically tagged half of the birds, so 112 birds in this group. 
um, and track them for three weeks. Um, and I'm really, really hoping that we could actually look at these birds and see whether there are some kind of subgroups that move together to the system, um, just because they're, they are like a, have their sta stable hierarchy within the subgroup and they might use resources um, at the same time simultaneously. And maybe they're kind of, um, how, well, that one group would feed, whereas the other group is, I don't know, egg laying, for instance. Um, yeah. Does that answer, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. Nila is asking uh, whether you have looked at the dominance between the hands and how you think that would affect their movement patterns. Yeah, that's a really cool, good question because unfortunately we didn't look um, at dominance. Um, so this whole experiment was basically a pilot study to actually just to validate the, the system. So we don't have any information ab about these birds. We just picked them randomly, put the, the sensors on, um, let them in for 10 days and took them off again without even weighing them or looking at their injury or whatever. Um, but um, looking at or thinking about how it would affect move, um, their movement, I definitely think that there are a lot of um, a lot of hierarchy related things going on in these systems. So as I mentioned, there might be different subgroups, but these subgroups need to form if they are any, we are not really sure about that. Um, and you can definitely see a lot of aggression happening in these flocks. So especially with the brown hybrids, we have lots of problems with feather pecking, um, which is to some degree um, hierarchy related. So if we have unstable groups or a group size where they cannot form these subgroups, this might affect how they just peck each other, for instance, that's just one, one aspect. Um, and we know that for instance, more, um, more dominant birds are more likely to actually squeeze into a nest box and um, get the other birds out of the nest box, for instance. So um, really, really good question. I don't know if the dominance aspects are enough that birds actually move away from the others. Um, I could imagine that it is, but definitely one thing that we would need to look at and it would be really, really interesting because it would also cause or it would have implication for, implications for how we design these environments, right? So do we need to give them more space in the nest box so that all birds can nest at the same time? Because right now these birds are, um, or the nest box area specifically, is made in a way that only a few birds can nest at the same time. And we basically expect from the birds that they distribute themselves or they're egg laying over the whole day. So definitely not ideal. Thanks for, for the question. Oh, thanks for your answer. Uh, we have another question from Jen. Um, um, the question is, how do you measure the faults and whether you could talk a little bit more about how these measurements or about these measurements? Yes, of course. Um, so with the falls, there are basically two things there. In these systems, there are some movement patterns that are very unlikely to happen naturally. Um, so I talked about the birds, the birds jumping from the nest box directly into the litter. That's something we can, we can we see quite often because it's not super high and they have some space. So you can see them actually sitting on the perch, looking down and then jumping actively. However, there are um, movements, for instance, from the top tier to the lower tier, which is basically a, like a 90 degree angle with lots of perches in between. So if we see a direct transition like this, um, which happens really, really rapidly, so basically like a bird falling, we would assume that it's rather a fall than an active transition. So just to give you an idea, and actually going back to, um, to Network graphs, uh, sorry, um, these graphs. Um, let me see where it is. Here it is. So um, if you look at, at the slide here, I highlighted the last, the very last movement towards the top tier. And this is basically what you often see in birds. Birds um, towards the end of the day, when the dusk phase starts, they move upwards because that's where they roost. Um, so all the green movements are the last upward movements during the light phase. So once light, the lights are off, it's very unlikely that they are still moving because they're just so controlled by um, photo period. So this is the first bird here. Then the second bird here, again, a lot of upwards, really, really steep upwards movement. And then these weird movements after dark um, that are pointing in the downwards direction. Um, and the same for the last bird here. Um, an upward movement following by a downward movement already in the dark. 
So um, I would say it's not really measuring false. We don't have any video um, analysis that we could actually match with these observations, unfortunately. But just the fact that it's very unlikely that these birds move downwards after the lights are on, just based on their motivation to roost in high positions, we assume that these are false. Um, also, another one um, I can show you is actually looking at the roosting location. So I don't want to go through this whole graph, but if you look at the first bird here, she is roosting on the, in the lower tier most of the days, but the first three days she was roosting on the top tier. And then on the second and the third day, you can see these weird patterns that might be a fall. And after these potential falls, her movement patterns somewhat change and she starts roosting in the litter area, which is, re um, no, sorry, not in the litter, in the lower tier, which is not, you don't see a lot of birds sitting there for the whole night. So um, this is just another indication of the potential fall. Again, just to say, just to say it actually is a fall, we need to validate that with video observations and actually define what is a fall, but the problems already start there. So we base it on potentially involuntary movements downwards after the, the light is out, basically. Okay, thanks. Thanks for, for answering this. Are there any more questions from the audience? Also, if questions come up later, feel free to shoot me an email or contact me otherwise. Yeah, or um, if you have further questions, also feel free to drop them in the webinar channel as well. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I would again like to thank Christina for presenting her talk today. Um, I hope we will see many of you next week uh, for, the, for the upcoming webinar as well. Uh, next week uh, we will have Ben Ferrer presenting or talking about reproducibility and open science, which is a topic that is not particular or not only relevant for applied ethology but uh, it's also of great importance for our research field. So again, I would like to thank Christina, uh, but also you as the audience for attending this webinar and hopefully see many of you next week.